In this lecture, we will be discussing how to assess animal bite wounds and abscesses and how to manage them surgically. This is the last video for this chapter. Animal bites tend to be one of the most common causes of traumatic wounds, second only to trauma from accidents, like being hit by a car, or intentional harm to animals, like gunshot wounds. These animal bites tend to happen with different scenarios, which entails an individualized clinical plan for patients need to be devised. There is no rule which fits all patients with animal bites. However, there is an existing foundational knowledge on how to formulate a surgical treatment plan. Most cases of bite wounds would appear like this. If owners were not there during the incident, they will not be able to tell you all the information that you may need, such as what exact body locations has it been bitten. Not all wounds will have active bleeding, and dogs having a thick coat would at time conceal the presence of these wounds. This is why the first thing you need to do to fully assess the damage is to clip the hair around the wound. Some veterinarians would even go to the extent of clipping the entire body of a dog to make sure no wounds will be left untreated. Animal bite wounds can be open or closed. Open wounds are easy to spot since bleeding may have occurred and the hair coat of the patient is matted with blood. These wounds may be in a form of a puncture wound, a laceration, or a combination of the two. On the other hand, closed wounds tend to have a vascular damage within and appear as hematomas, as seen right here. These are harder to spot if the animal has a thick coat. For animal bites, the commonly affected areas would be the neck, limbs, head, chest, shoulder, abdomen, and perineal regions. So, in short, everywhere, there is no predilection site for animal bites. Animals act on instinct, and when provoked, they tend to go for the body areas which, if hit, will incapacitate their prey. This trauma tends to result in multiple wounds rather than just one or two. Patients may die from this trauma due to infection or the immediate effect of the trauma. Patients may even appear stable and bright, but die a few days later due to SIRS or SEERS and sepsis. SEERS stands for Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. With its name, it is a pathologic syndrome wherein there is inflammation in major organs of the body which causes a cascade. We will discuss this in the next slide. Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Let's take the first word that should be very familiar to you. Inflammatory. Review on immunology. Inflammation is a normal immune response to a noxious insult, which may be infectious or non-infectious. Now, do you still remember the five signs of inflammation? I'll give you two seconds for that since it's so oh, easy. The five cardinal signs would be heat, redness, pain, swelling, and that's right, loss of function. Now, inflammation is normally localized and it is protective in nature. However, in a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, there is an exaggeration of this immune response. It may be brought about by infection, manipulation during surgery, hemorrhage, ischemia, or trauma, like an animal bite. An excessive production of pro-inflammatory mediators overpowers the counter anti-inflammatory mechanisms, which serves to regulate it. This causes the animal to be put into a prolonged pro-inflammatory state. 
what they call a cytokine storm happens, which causes vasodilation and increased vascular permeability. This is a slippery slope, which leads to irreversible tissue damage and consequent multisystemic organ failure, which is eventually the cause of death for these patients. Now, Sears has a very small difference from sepsis, and this is outlined in this table. Sears and sepsis are manifested clinically with the following signs as outlined in Table 3. There is two phases to this. There is a hyperdynamic phase and an advanced disease progression phase. Hyperdynamic phase is a compensatory status. Everything is compensating for the vasodilation and increased vascular permeability, which happens with seers. There is increase in temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate. However, the body cannot maintain this level of activity. So, if this is left untreated or left unrecognized, this disease, or this condition rather, would progress. And you will now see a decompensatory status wherein blood pressure will go down, temperature will go down, even pulses will go weak. Now, some patients would show historical findings that is common that uh, would usually lead to systemic inflammatory response syndrome. That would be vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, appetite loss, and some mental depression. Now, note, cats do not develop these clinical signs. Rather, they progress into the advanced disease progression and they would usually show bradycardia and hypotension. This is why it is very important for each one of you to always remember the basics of physical examination and the normal values of the vital signs that we discussed for accurate and efficient recognition of the signs pointing to impending sears and sepsis. Patients with bite wounds tend to exhibit an iceberg effect. There is minimal surface damage, but extensive damage underneath its skin. The skin may only exhibit minimal surface damage upon presentation to your clinic, as shown in image 1A. This patient was treated with superficial wound cleaning and prescribed with antibiotics and pain medications. It was bright. It was eating. It was good. However, after a few days, it came back to your clinic with its body looking like this. The canine and feline skin tends to be freely movable, especially if the patient is well hydrated. When animals bite, their teeth punctures the skin first and tears into deeper tissue. Try to notice this when a dog bites a cat or tries to bite a bone. They tend to shake their heads after they have grasped it with their teeth. The result may manifest only as minor puncture wounds from the outside. However, in the deeper tissues that we cannot see, the teeth is creating dead space and inoculating the wound with bacteria and foreign material. This is why animal bites are called iceberg effect. You may see the iceberg above the surface and may appear to you as, you know, trouble. However, the real problem is beneath the surface. In this image, the inguinal area of a patient is showing severe signs of hematoma and necrosis can be seen on the areas bitten, as highlighted here. The deadly combination of the vitalized or necrotic tissue combined with dead space, compromised blood supply, and serum accumulation is a very good environment which promotes bacterial growth. There is this big possibility that if this is left untreated, your dog or your patient would come in to your clinic, 
with this entire area necrotized and smelling really foul because there is this infection that has been brooding beneath the skin surface. For wounds that look superficial, you may probe these with sterile straight instruments to give you an idea of the depth and the amount of dead space under the skin. However, the damage may be deeper than probed. Animal bite wounds are not always straight, like a normal puncture wound. They can be a laceration, like this image on the right. Either way, these wounds need to be addressed with a thorough clinical plan. Whatever a wound's appearance may be, all bite wounds must be opened, explored, debrided, and lavaged. Why? Can't we just clean it with hydrogen peroxide and povidone iodine? These processes are done to reveal the full extent of the damage, which cannot be seen or assessed superficially, and to remove the vitalized or necrotic tissue, which can cause sears and sepsis. If you have assessed that there is only minimal damage to the skin and its underlying tissues, the wound may be cleaned and closed with a minor surgery. However, if wounds presented to you are severely contaminated, infected, and the soft tissues around it are severely traumatized, these wounds must not be closed or sealed off because they need a hole or an avenue for the fluids, the discharges, to drain. The oral cavity of dogs and cats and whatever animal that could bite you, and even our oral cavity, are ridden with multiple disease-causing organisms. These are outlined in this table. Because of this fact, antibiotic therapy must be given immediately to counter bacterial growth and infection. Cephalosporins and penicillins are preferred antibiotic of choice because of their broad spectrum activity against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. These drug families would tend to do but they should not replace the need to conduct culture and antibiotic sensitivity testing to the wounds present to make sure you are using the right drug. Pain management may not be the first thing that comes to mind when addressing bite wounds, but this must be prioritized for every patient you will have. Even if you cannot see it, it doesn't mean it's not there and it doesn't need your attention. In fact, this might be the only feeling the patient is experiencing at that moment, along with fear. What are the different analgesics that come to mind? Pharma review. <laughs> well, one thing you must remember is you must steer away from NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs until the patient is rehydrated and cleared from any gastrointestinal hepatic, or renal compromise. Surgical correction of animal bite wounds must start with a thorough preparation of the surgical site. Since there is a possibility that the deeper part of the wound is larger than what we see from the outside, we need to clip a large amount of hair surrounding the wound. The wounds are then probed again to its depth and opened up with scissors to actually see the damage to the associated structures within. During wound exploration, you must check for necrotic tissue, presence of foreign bodies like teeth and debris, and signs of infection. But wait, what does necrotic tissue look like? One is the color of the tissue. Necrotic tissue ranges from black, if it's dry, to white-gray, if it's moist. Also, it would not bleed when cut. They also lack sensation. Lastly, necrotic tissue may be friable, 
it would lack structural integrity and or have limited to no body attachment. It would easily get detached when you are undermining the wound. If there is no necrotic tissue and the underlying tissue is healthy, trim the wound edges for proper wound approximation and lavage or irrigate the area with warm sterile isotonic fluids. If there is necrotic tissue present, these need to be debrided or removed until only healthy tissue is left to prevent the progression of local inflammation to sepsis and sears. Also, make sure to do your culture and antibiotic sensitivity testing to these wounds. I hope you still remember how to perform a wound lavage just to make sure. Wound lavage, also called flushing or wound irrigation, is done to mechanically remove debris from the wound with the use of different kinds of fluids. Usually, it would be warm, sterile, isotonic fluids delivered under moderate pressure. This pressure is usually reached effectively using a 19-gauge needle, as you can see right here, which could be connected to a 25 mil syringe or connected to an IV line that is connected to an IV bag. Um, there is also another kind of fluid that you could use which is very much available to anyone and that is tap water in case you don't have isotonic fluids. Wound lavage is done to reduce the number of bacteria and other microbes on the surface of the wound which would help prevent any post-operative complications. A cleaner wound would also let you see the actual appearance of the wound bed and effectively assess the tissues. The more contaminated a wound is, the more irrigation it would need. Note on the pressure of delivery of the fluids. It was said that too much pressure would cause more harm to your patient because it can potentially drive debris deeper into healthy tissue. In clinical cases wherein the abdominal cavity is punctured after an animal bite, you might need to consider performing an exploratory laparotomy to thoroughly examine the extent of the damage. This image shows a hematoma on a part of the small intestine after a small dog is bitten on its abdomen. This patient is not showing any gastrointestinal signs that could point out that there is a problem here. But here we are seeing a consequent damage of an animal bite in a body cavity. Now, thoracic injuries are more severe and treated as emergent as compared to abdominal injuries. Why do you think thoracic injuries are more critical? Write your answers in the comment section of this lecture video. Depending on the level of contamination and tissue damage, animal bite wounds can be closed. However, because of the nature of the wound, these are oftentimes left open and bandaged to optimize drainage. These bandages are removed daily and we repeat the same process of debridement and lavage for at least three to five days. This is done until signs of wound granulation and contraction is seen. Wounds may heal through secondary intention healing or tertiary intention wherein it is sutured closed after enough contraction has occurred. In this particular patient, the damage has caused a big laceration on its lateral neck and has pulled the skin away from each wound edge. Do you notice the cut IV lines sutured on the wound edges? Yes, they are familiar. The dog underwent tension-relieving horizontal mattress sutures with stents to ease the skin tension and eventually pull the skin together. 
The goal is to suture it closed after the skin has healed and contracted more closely together. Congratulations! You have finished the first chapter of this course entitled Skin and Reconstructive Surgery. But wait! We should end this chapter with a video assignment. Number two, if you want to see an actual clinical case of what we just discussed about animal bite wounds, please take time to watch the story of DeBarco. He was in a very, very bad incident of dog bites. His whole back had a lot of holes in it. It is a very good video because you could see the different consequences of this um, very unpredictable condition. You will be able to see how surgery was used to manage the condition and how different wound healing methods were utilized to help the barco. So you may click the link or go to YouTube if you're not there yet, right in the search bar, Vet Ranch, and the title of this episode. Viciously attacked. Thank you and see you on our next chapter.